Have you ever stuck an earring in your nose? Uh, have you ever shaved your head, half of it, and dyed the other half green? And you say, don't be ridiculous. I'm not a punker. No, I wouldn't dream of doing that. That's for the half-integrated people. That's for the people that are immature. That's not the kind of thing I do. No, I wouldn't touch it. Have you ever bought a car because it looked the coolest thing on the road? Have you ever bought a winter coat because it would make you different from the other people in your office and they would notice you? Have you ever bought a lipstick because the color was rather different and set forth the difference between you and others and the uniqueness that your appearance has over that of others? Well, of yes, I have, but I mean that's just personal taste. Uh, of course, everybody buys things because it enables them to be themselves. That's all I'm being. I'm just being myself. But don't you see that really whether you stick an earring in your nose, whether you dye half of your hair green or not, or whether you buy a car that just looks different from everybody else, there is a, a lurking tendency deep down in all of us to do things primarily to get attention, <laughs> primarily to get other people to notice us, and often to express just the fact that we're different from everybody else. And if you say, well, I am different from everybody else, I mean, I am, I'm unique. Uh, yes, I agree, you are unique. There's nobody like you in the universe. There's never been anybody like you. There never will be anybody like you. And you say, yeah, yeah, I know that, but uh, everybody else doesn't seem to know it, so I want to get them to know it. And then I say to you, well, why do you? And you say, well, just because it's true, it's right. But really, isn't it a fact that the reason we do it is because we feel we are unique, but nobody else notices it, and we feel that we need it to be noticed, that our uniqueness is there to be noticed that we were put here in this world for somebody to appreciate us, somebody to acknowledge us, somebody to notice the little private things that we have that nobody else has. We feel we were put here for someone else to be aware of it. And in fact, we were. We were put here by a dear creator that made us, who does love you and who does know you and who knows better than even your mother knows how unique you are. But of course, we have given up believing in him and we have given, given up even trusting him. And so we have determined we live this life as practical atheists. But what we lack is this sense of acknowledgement from him, this sense of love that he has for us. And so we have to get it from somewhere. And most of us have committed ourselves to trying to get it from other people. And that's the origin of a great deal of the antics that we get up to from we're little children wanting our mother to be impressed with the way we have stuck all the little pins into our clothing or the way we have messed up all the porridge or the cornflakes that she gave us or the way we have beaten our spoon on our uh, chair so that the people who were visiting our parents would see that we're there right from those early antiques right up to the time when we get our gold watch after 30 or 40 years of a service to our firm, we have been anxious for somebody to notice us, that we are different and that we are unique because we have a great sense of a need for love, a need for somebody to love us and to value us. And so we have started to try to substitute for that love uh, the approval of other people. And that's why we get into this business of 
preoccupation with self-esteem and self-worth and why we go into all these psychological deep discussions and all these sensitivity groups and all this therapeutic attention that we give to each other because we're all intent on trying to get the love that we need and that we were made for and you were actually made for that love. But it's a love that is the love of the one significant other in the universe, not the love of all the other insignificant others in the universe. But of course, we try to find that. And you know it makes us into monsters. You know those of us who are husbands and fathers, how we uh, insist that the wife treats us as maybe not the lord of the manor or the king of the kingdom, but we certainly demand that she treat us as the head of this home and as somebody important. And often we get very irritable with her because she does not seem to give us our place. Indeed, it's funny how that uh, phrase would come up in many of our homes. The children would often say it, the wives would often say it, well, I'm not given my place. I'm not given the place of respect that I should have. People, the others in the home, don't really value me. They don't really appreciate me. And so often we cry ourselves asleep or we grieve ourselves to sleep through feeling that other people aren't giving us the attention that we ought to have. And it's the same in the office. You know how in the business, whether we're bosses or whether we're sub-bosses or whether we're little nothings that just are trying to wield our little bit of power, we're intent on trying to get people to notice that we are something. We are something. We control this office. We control these forms. If we're bureaucrats, you know how it goes. We feel we're part of an impersonal system anyway, and the only way we can get any personality into it is if we wield our little bit of influence. And often we make life intolerable for other people. We're so anxious to get our little bit of attention. And so it makes us into clowns. Clowns that become the playthings of other people. Other people can play on us like a violin. They can treat us like puppets and marionettes. If they just give us our strokes, if they just give us our little bit of attention, we will stand up and beg. We will go through all kinds of silly activities and silly performances just to get another little cookie of love from them. And so we become really cookie monsters. We just will gobble up cookies. We'll gobble up any little bit of praise or attention that they will give us. And so, of course, we have become very perverted in our personalities. We've become like little actors and actresses who are always on uh, show. We are always on we're always trying to get people to love us, and we'll do anything for that. We'll actually compromise our principles. We'll act against our own best understanding of things. We'll act against our own best interests in, in, at times, just to get people to attend to us and give us a little bit of that love that we feel we were made for. So our personalities have become per per perverted. We've become utterly dominated by man fear. It started off as men's approval. It started off as a desire for men to acknowledge us and approve of us. But as we become dominated by that desire, then we begin to fear their disapproval. We begin to fear their frowns, the boss's frowns, the wife's frowns. We begin to hate and fear disapproval. And so we begin to come under men fear. And our lives become dominated by fear of men. Uh, we become driven people who are driven to do things just to avoid other people disapproving of us. And our lives come under not the love of men, but the fear of men. And so we're afraid to say what we believe is right in the office, lest people think we're square or stupid or old-fashioned, and we begin to be the very opposite of what we are because of men fear. So that's one of the ways in which we have become perverted in our personalities through depending on people and their love in place of the love of the Creator in whom we have stopped believing and trusting. There are some other consequences of this turning to the world of things for the world of God himself. Let's share a little more tomorrow about it and it'll perhaps give you some insight into your 